Excited to welcome Florida State Associate Head Coach Brooke Wyckoff to the podcast. Brooke was the interim head coach for the 2020-21 year as Sue Semera took a one-year leave of absence. The result was leading Florida State to its eighth consecutive NCAA tournament appearance and a fourth place finish in the ACC and earned a top four seed despite being picked eighth in the ACC preseason coaches poll. Brooke has sparked the rise of Florida State women's basketball program as a standout player, as an assistant coach, and now as the interim coach. Back in 2014, Brooke co-founded an organization called Moms in Coaching. This is a support group for mothers who are coaching, but are unsure if they can be full-time coaches and full-time moms. All right, Brooke, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm super honored and excited to be here. Well, this is going to be fun. And uh, let's start just on reflecting on your season. Uh, what a whirlwind that must have been, obviously, with COVID, the pandemic, uh, thrown into the head coaching role, which I know you were prepared for. But uh, all those things come at you pretty quick, don't they? They sure do. And and yeah, in a normal year, normal time, you're never really prepared, as they say, to step in as a head coach uh, when you've never done it. And so adding COVID on top of that was an interesting challenge. But honestly, uh, reflecting back, it was a it was a good thing. It helped me. Uh, it forced me and the rest of us uh, to stay in the moment, to take it day by day, because there was so much uncertainty. And you know, obviously, stepping into that role normally it can be very overwhelming. There's a million things to think about. But when you're literally forced by a pandemic to take it moment to moment, day to day. Uh, that was really helpful for me in stepping into that role, uh, as well as having an amazing staff already built in an amazing group of girls that just bought into what we were, you know, what we had to do and the coaching change. So it was a phenomenal experience. So many coaches have mentioned that type of situation. And uh, one of the things that they've all kind of noted is the, the pandemic and dealing with all the COVID related issues helped you focus in on what's really important. And in a way, it, it helped a lot of coaches probably improve their coaching in a sense. Yeah, it really did. I mean, you, what is real, most important is usually not, you know, how we're getting through a screen or, how, you know, how we're going to attack this defense. It's how are our players doing? What's going on in their lives? What is their mental state? Uh, you know, where, how are we building them as people? That's the most important thing. And it's so easy in, in life just to get caught up in all the, the other stuff and the details and the fun basketball X's and O's, but the, you know, being impacted by the pandemic and, and the havoc it was wreaking across our world and in our personal lives really did allow us to force us to focus on, you know, what's going on with us, with, with each individual as a person, where are they at in life? How's their mental health? Uh, so again, that was a great opportunity to dive into that, to dig into that, our theme of the year was just gratitude um, and just being being thankful for the opportunity we had that day to do whatever it is we were able to do, whether it was be in quarantine and, and connect on Zoom or play an actual game. Uh, we were just, we were focused on gratitude. I love that. And I love talking about gratitude, particularly when I do summer camps and I talk to young people and I just talk about how gratitude is the thing that they miss the most probably and need the most is that just if you're happy or you're sad or you're depressed or you're lonely or you go through, although these are natural emotions, but when you come back to gratitude, it usually brings you back to a place of center. Is that what you were trying to get them to understand through this process? Absolutely. I was trying to teach that just that, you know, our brains are built to focus on one thing at a time or really bad multitaskers as humans. Um, and so exactly as you said, when you are, brought back to gratitude when you force your mind to think of what i'm thankful for and what's going on right in this moment you're not thinking about anything else and if so if those thoughts are positive um and you're just focusing on whatever it is that you're thankful for big or small you're not thinking about the the stresses uh at least in that moment and then training yourself to do that over longer periods of time training yourself to get to that get back to that gratitude more quickly when things are going wrong so we did, we talked a lot about that. And, and I think the players are really interested in that mental side of it. It just, it's not just about like, oh, you guys have all this stuff and we're just, we should be thankful that we get to play basketball and be on scholarship. No, it's about really your mental health and, and a lesson for life that, you know, when things are going wrong, again, like you said, no matter what emotion you're feeling, we can really bring ourselves back to um, a place of calm, a place of reset and be able to move forward in more positive way. 
I'm so happy to hear that's part of your program and part of what you share. So important. And uh, another curious question is just Sue obviously did a tremendous job building this program with your help. You've been there a long time and a former player as well. But uh, I'm curious then when you finally get your chance to be the head coach, are you changing some things? Are you doing some things your way? I think I, I have to, you know, you, you have to be authentic. And Sue has preached that. Um, you know, she's always talking about that and getting to a place where we can be authentic, whatever that means, you know, good or bad, ugly. A lot of times it's ugly. Um, and so she was very encouraging and, and did a, a phenomenal job of letting go. And I can't imagine how hard that must have been for her to watch from a distance, to not, you know, micromanage and, and ask a million questions every single day. Um, she was there as a guide for me, but she let me be me and, and do what we do or do what needed to be done in that moment. The good thing is though, I was raised in this program. We do share the same values, the same philosophy at the core. Uh, but we did, you know, we, we tweaked some things basketball wise um, and which had, you know, better or worse results. Some were worse results <laughs> and I'm happy she's back to kind of, you know, get into what she's super passionate about basketball wise. Um, so yeah, it was a really good balance of allowing me to be me. I'm different than Sue, but still sticking to the same philosophy and values that have built this program to where it is today. Is there something that you for the last few years have thought as an assistant coach, hey, listen, I really want to use this or I think this is a great idea. And maybe Sue wasn't as keen that you tried. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Yes, I will. I will say there was it wasn't something that I necessarily wanted to do, but I felt more freedom to be able to tweak things defensively to do to mix things up. We have had a lot of success over the years defensively, and we usually do what we do. And we, we said that so many times, like, let's just do what we do. We're good at it. You know, it's what these kids know. This year, we really did um, become more scout based and kind of tweaked a little bit defensively, whether it be ball screen coverages, uh, how we're covering off ball screens. We tweaked our transition defense. Uh, which was like, oh my gosh, I was just thinking, oh boy, Sue is going to be like, what the heck are you guys doing? <laughs> um, and, you know, it had mixed results. What I, what I learned was that Sue's passion, her commitment to defense and rebounding and just getting our players to believe in that, to believe that is what wins basketball games is everything. It doesn't, you can tweak all you want. You can change this for this player or that team. If your team doesn't have the passion or the culture to just get after it defensively and get stops, it doesn't matter. And that's what I learned. And we're trying to get back to that of being just really hard nosed, getting stopped defense defensively, and and that will translate into our offense. <laughs> well, it obviously worked because you had, I think, the second net rating in all of college basketball behind South Carolina. So obviously, <laughs> some of it worked, and let's credit it that. Did. Let's credit that. <laughs> That's okay. great. And uh, I think uh, just coming back, like I was a little surprised, to be honest, when we set up this podcast, I thought I'd be talking to you as the head coach at another school. And I know that will happen eventually. Um, but now that you have this situation where obviously Sue's coming back. So I'm wondering, what did the debrief session look like when she came back and you're discussing the things that worked and the things that didn't? Yeah, there, and that's an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, it, it was really, we're, we're fortunate because we have pretty much the entire team back mm -hmm. from last year. We added some freshmen. So we really do know this team. We got to know this team last year. So there was that part of the debrief was big. Of, she knew these players from recruiting them. She obviously stayed in touch throughout the year, but we found out a lot about these players last year on the court and who they were and what they can and can't do, strengths and weaknesses. That's been a huge debrief. And, and what she's loved is that we told her all year, man, this is such a great group to coach. We love their buy-in, their commitment to wanting to get it right. They're just good people, every single one of them. And the first practice we had back this summer, she turned to me, she's like, wow, you're right. This is an awesome group of kids. Like, um, and then, you know, again, even today, before we went to workouts this morning, we we're talking about ball screen coverages and, and this is what we did last year. This is what was, what helped us and what we we're good at, but what do you want, Sue? Do you want to be more aggressive? Do we need to tweak things? Uh, it's been an interesting daily conversation for sure. 
Well, and imagine benefit to both of you and to your whole staff and to your players is that it, it's going to push Sue to a certain extent to think differently than she has maybe for the past, whatever, 10 years. Because yeah. again, she's been incredibly successful. So it's, it's hard in those moments to think about other things. Absolutely. I, I give so much credit to her. She is always questioning in a good way, always pushing, always wanting to find, you know, the next best way to do it and, and wants to understand. So she came back and said, you know, started questioning everything that we'd been doing before she had left. And getting that time away and coming back, I think has been great for her to really come in with fresh eyes um, and an open mind, which she's doing. And also, you know, challenges me to explain to her why we did things the way we did and really have data to back that up. Why I think it needs to stay the same or no, now we need to get back to what we used to do. It really challenges me um, in our conversation and, and to have, you know, evidence to back up you know, why we do what we do. It's great stuff. I'm so happy you had that experience. And uh, it, it's, it's just too bad in a way, because even the leave of absence, and we're going to get into some other topics here, which are a little sensitive, but the leave of absence is perceived as a negative, right? And Sue did it obviously for all the amazing reasons she did. But I remember even when I took a sabbatical, people looked at me like, how could you possibly do that? That seems crazy. And it's like, it shouldn't be this thing that we look at and say, this is a negative because obviously it helped you. It helped your players and it helped Sue. So it's probably at this point, one of the best things she could have possibly done. It really was. And, and the thing about her leaving was that she had done all the work to set in place a great group of people, a system, a philosophy value system that it did continue her legacy, whether she was here or not, she had done the work to such a great extent that it continued to go. We always talk about um, a, Sue's mentor, uh, Jane Albright, who is an amazing coach, uh, has a famous quote that we say that, you know, you, you have a bucket of water and your hands in that bucket of water and we're the hand and the, you take that hand out. What does the bucket of water do? It just covers up where the hand was like this thing will continue to go on. The work will get done no matter who's here or who's not. As long as those, the, the philosophy, the culture has been set in place everybody else that can buy into that will continue to keep it going. So it really was, it was a positive for everybody. Um, and we're ready just with a new fresh motivation. And now that we're all back together to move forward and push it, push it further. Yeah. The year I took a sabbatical, our team made the final four in our conference, had the rookie of the year in the country, different things like that happened. And I only took it as a compliment. Right. Right. <laughs> we built a program where they don't yeah. need me. Yeah. That's exactly. a great thing. Yeah. Exactly. It's tremendous. So uh, let's get into this moms in coaching. Can you first give us a little bit of an understanding of what that is? Moms in coaching is a group of women um, who are mostly mothers and coaching at mostly at the college level, some professionally, some at the high school level. And it's also, uh, we have a few members that are not mothers yet, but are thinking about being mothers and, and curious how this all works about being a mom and coaching. Really what it is, is a first and foremost, a support group uh, where we can come together, whether that be every year at the final four, whether that be on a zoom, uh, we've had newsletter podcasts, we have social media, where really it's a support system for mothers that are going through this pretty rigorous lifestyle of, especially at the college level, but any level of coaching, uh, what that means to the time uh, that you invest outside of the home, how you quote unquote balance that with kids. We're here to just say, Hey, there's lots of us out there. Uh, you can do this. And also to give practical advice um, and, and things like that. The other side of moms and coaching is to be an advocate and a, and a platform to keep women in coaching in general, um, women coaching women, especially, you know, we, we, we love men in coaching. I have no problem having men coaching, coaching women. Um, but we do have a decline in women coaches. And I think it's just so important uh, to keep women coaching women for representation and, and all of those things. One of the biggest detractors from that is, is, family and the, and, and just like in any field. So we want to be advocates and, and support to how do we make this a business where you can be a mother, you can be a coach, can keep women in coaching, make that something that's what, that people want to do. 
Uh, we want to be those examples to young women, our young players and women that are just getting into coaching that may not have children yet. So there's so many questions that come from this, but the first maybe is more of a statement that the world is just a better place when we give moms the space to be moms. And it's amazing that even in this era, that it's still like breastfeeding and different things like that are still perceived as like taboo and negative. And it just, it still is mind boggling to me sometimes. And we're going to get into a bit, bunch of this stuff, but let's first start with this concept of mentorship, because this is no different than any other type of mentorship. People need role models to see that this is possible. And that must be one of the biggest helps to keeping females in coaching is seeing someone like you manage all of this or famously Adara Barnes, obviously at the final four, managing being a mother. And it was great. And I'm glad it started more of the conversation to a mainstream. Absolutely. That, that was huge. Just what Adia did um, at the final four, just being herself. I mean, it wasn't like she set out to do anything other than go win a national championship. Um, but she's obviously a fantastic example for, for women everywhere for, and, and for men, it's, it's just like, this is, this is real life. We want families. And when you're coaching college level players as well, they're in that time of their lives where they're no longer under the roof of their families. Most of the time, they're not yet adults that are going to have their families yet. They're in that looking around, figuring out who they are, figuring out what the world is all about on their own. And again, when they can see these examples of people being at the top of their field, pursuing a, a, an excellent career, but also being able to just value family. I mean, not just have family, but like, and not even balancing it because balance is really, really hard and probably not possible, but placing that value, seeing family, seeing kids around, seeing women, men being great dads and coaches at the same time, that matters. And then whatever choice they make later on, they make, but they've seen it done and have that in their minds, as you said, re as representation. So what are some things that we can do to remove this perception that having your kids at practice, like older or younger, mm -hmm. obviously breastfeeding, all these different things are like negatives and they're like taking away from your coaching, but they're really not, are they? Right. No, they're not. And that, that is the, the perception. Um, you know, my thing is like, we all, we all have to perform on our job that there is no excuse for not being able to perform. It just looks a little bit differently when you have a family, when you have outside obligations. Um, and so that's the most important thing. I don't think there's anybody in a room when we get together with moms and coaching that are going to be like, yeah, I don't mind being you know, not as good at my job so I can take care of my kids. They're not going to say that they, they, we err on the side of, no, I want to be the best coach I can be. And a lot of times we might let the parenting part fall through the cracks. I know that's, that's the inclination that I, a lot of times naturally have, and, and we have to self-correct those things. And that, that self-correction becomes easier when it is more, uh, you know, readily accepted that, Yes, I have a family. Yes, my the way I get things done look different, but I'm still confident that I can get this job done and do it to the best of my ability. That's why Adia Barnes, you know, there's so many women out there that are doing exactly what she's doing, but her getting to that national championship game, being at the top of the profession in that moment while breastfeeding, while having her young son there as well was huge because that is showing that we can still do this job at a high level is the first and foremost getting that through people's heads. <laughs> totally. And, uh, you know, and I, I like to believe that Arizona and the whole university, you know, not just in that moment when they got the final floor, but throughout the whole time she's been coaching has supported her in this process because she definitely didn't try and hide it, which I think we were all grateful for as well, is this didn't need to be swept under the rug. This is can be very public and it can be very known that she was doing it. Absolutely. And that's the thing, like you mentioned, so she hadn't tried to hide it. She, um, I think she had made it very clear that when she took that job, and this is what a lot of head coaches do, uh, is they make it clear when they're going in and they, they make sure that their values, family values are aligned with that of the administration. And that's one thing we talk a lot about in moms and coaching is that that piece is very important. If you're a head coach, you've got to have that and make sure that the family values and what you envision it looking like aligns with your administration. And as assistant coaches, you have to make sure that those align with your head coach. 
and ultimately the administration as well. Um, and there is a lot of disparity across the board from institution to institution, program to program uh, in that area. That, and, and that's where, again, I always say, what can we expect at, in terms of a uniformity of, across college campuses when in our nation, we don't give paid family leave, you know, you get family leave, but we're, you know, we're like one of all the, the, the developed world and most of the, like 99% of the countries give paid family leave and we don't. Um, and so I don't expect much from institutions <laughs> across the board. Which is sad. Uh, it's really yeah. sad. And, and just to give a little quick, I researched it just before I came on, but the U S policy is the worst on the list of the world's richest companies. That's according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, I think it was like something like the U.S. is only country among 41 nations that does not mandate any paid leave for new parents. Yes. Which, right. which again, I, I'm sorry, there is a direct correlation between mothers being mothers and the, the quality of the person that they can help raise, especially during those ages. And then the other part is obviously the connection between breastfeeding and health long-term health of the baby. And I'm so grateful. And I thank my wife every time it comes up about the fact that she breastfed fed both of our kids beyond two years. Mm, wow. and, I can't, and, I, and maybe I wasn't as sensitive at the time about kind of the stigma with that because yeah. I just assumed it was normal. <laughs> <laughs> you are lucky, man. She, yes. wow, that's amazing. Oh, I'm so grateful. <laughs> I know you know. Yeah, that is that is something, you know, of course, across the board, just culturally, the whole breastfeeding thing um, in this profession. Uh, it's really, really difficult. I, you know, I was clamoring to get back to work as soon as I could, um, had great child care set up, but the whole I wanted to continue breastfeeding and recruiting and being on the road and hours of, you know, when we practice and what we have going, you know, it's, it is difficult to, to make sure that you can continue that. And a lot of women have to make tough choices. Um, I'm very grateful that I have a very understanding boss and coach Sue from the beginning. Uh, she was more than happy to just say whatever you need. Um, you know, we want to support you and we know you, you can do this. Uh, and that's, that is so, so important to have that support and encouragement and again, that doesn't mean a lowering of expectations of getting the job done. Uh, those stay the same. And I, I, would, I would argue that knowing that we are getting that support, knowing that there's people around us that understand what we're going through, we're gonna work that much harder to keep that standard of excellence or push beyond it. Um, it's a great motivator when you're feeling secure in your job, um, not to get lazier, but to work harder. Yeah, I don't know why that would be someone's perception at this point, but like, it's not, again, I say this all the time about players. It's not like they're trying to miss layups, right? <laughs> it's not like they're trying, and it's not like you're trying to lose games or do your job poorly. So why would the perception be that your kids, like, for example, my kids from a very young age came to practice all the time. And I just explained it to my players all the time and said, why wouldn't I want them a part of our team? Like being a part of it. And for them, they got a chance to see me be a role model as a dad. And for a lot of them, they didn't have great role models. So I think yes. that's another part of this for you is that you and all the other mothers that are including their motherhood in the process of coaching are modeling for other young people what it means to be a parent. Absolutely. And like we talked about before with, with Sue taking her leave of absence, doing what was best for her and her family. Same thing here. It's like everybody benefits. You bring your kids to practice and the kids obviously have a great time at this level. There's something about the connection with college kids. Again, they're out of the house. They're not around family and people of different ages. They're around their peers or adults to bring in younger kids, they, they crave that connection. Um, I found that there's just, there's something special about this age with young kids, whether it's a baby Agreed. toddler, what, and, and of course the young kids have, like you said, these role models to look up to, to see people that look like them out on the court, working their tails off, seeing success, going through adversity, and they see their parent leading in a different way, in a different setting. Um, I don't think anybody loses out, um, you know, and I, I think that's the stigma of, oh man, these kids are going to be running all over the place. They're going to be screaming and crying, distracting. That's more rare, I think, than, than 
than really all the benefits that come from it. So rare. I can't remember a moment other than maybe a washroom break or a washroom moment, like an accident <laughs> or something like that. I can't remember a moment that interrupted practice, to be honest. And exactly. my, I, I feel like my players genuinely enjoyed having them there as well. Mm -hmm. um, before we get into some of the other areas around coaching and females staying in coaching and retention of females in coaching, uh, just a quick aside, I actually got into a, an interview and I'll say a very short interview about a job. And one of my questions to them was, were my kids allowed at practice, like allowed in the facility, allowed in the place? And they said, no. Mm. And I immediately said, this isn't going to align with me then. Um, you know, they have to be a part of the process for me. And they, again, I guess, I guess it baffled me a little bit Yeah. But people, and I respect whatever people say, but that's kind of it. And that's what we're dealing with a little bit. And I imagine it's, well, I don't imagine, I know it's harder for women than a man even going into that situation. Yeah. Good for you. I, I, I have my hats off to you for asking that question and being willing to walk away. And, and we talk about that a lot in moms and coaching. There's a lot of really good jobs that come up and, uh, but when you get into the questioning and, and finding out the values of a program or an institution, again, there's a lot out there that don't accommodate the way that some people are comfortable with their family. And again, this, we're talking about sports, you know, this is, this is not a nine to five job. This is not an office setting where, you know, you, you, you sitting at your desk all day in a cubicle and, and doing what you do. And there is, really is, it's not an environment for kids in those settings. This is not that. Um, this is a 24 seven job, no matter where you are at what level. Um, and so <laughs> we've got to make these accommodations. And again, like you said, uh, just the connection that the players see um, in, in the sports world, it's just opens up so many more doors that just, it's not the same as a nine to five office atmosphere. Well, as a, as an employer, I would look at it and say, again, like it's, it's about mental health of my employees. And this, this big thing, which you can talk about is removing this mom's guilt, right? And, and, and if I remove that, then you're going to be a better employer employee for me. Absolutely. We talk about the mom guilt all the time. And this isn't exclusive, obviously, to coaching. This is, this is parenting in general. I mean, parenting, as you know, is one of the hardest, most challenging things to do. And, and a lot of times you're second guessing yourself just in regular life. And so we deal with it anyway. And then you add the pressures of, you know, the job and things like that and, and having to make choices. Uh, it's just the reality of, you know, you've got to put your time in different sp spots. You can't have, you cake and eat it too. You know, we can't have everything, uh, kids and work just come together seamlessly. So that guilt is implied. It's going to be there. But yes, the mitigation of it, a huge help is knowing that you have the support of your colleagues, your superiors, um, and that, you know, obviously the other side of it is that your kids are going to be okay. You're doing the best by them <laughs> and you're going to be a better mom when you've been supported at your workplace. Like you're well, saying, you that's know? it right there. Yeah. yeah. We're doing the best for the kids yeah. and I think just more people should be thinking that way so that we can help kids have better growth, yeah. better development, better experience and all those things. People yeah. might be surprised by this, that you sent me the Tucker um, Center uh, numbers that it, there has been a, not a gradual, but a significant decline uh, and stagnation of women's head coaches and women's collegiate teams in the United States since 1971. And people might be surprised that the numbers have dropped significantly. Yes. It is a surprising thing. You think women's sports and you think, oh, there's, you know, there's a bunch of women coaching women's sports. Right. And really when, when title nine, um, came into being that, uh, increased opportunities, um, and, in in terms of financially supported because it was the law, a lot of women's teams, especially, uh, when you have men's and women's basketball, two teams that, um, it's very easy to compare the resources and they're next to each other. So women's basketball resources and opportunities came up. Thank you. To, thanks to title nine. Um, and so that opportunity, uh, those opportunities increase the attractiveness of men coming into coaching women and which again is fine. Um, an unintended consequence, unintended consequence. Right. Um, and so there you have, you have more competition. And again, just with the understanding of who can balance what and who is more apt to be able to 
take on the, this kind of role. And again, when the, the resources increase, the pressure increases to do well, uh, you know, it, it, all of those things go up, which again, are great things. Um, but I started to, you know, weed, weed some women out and, and increase the competition with men that um, may have a better, you know, have more time or perceived to have more time or, or more, um, you know, ability to do jobs. Well, or the perception that they're more competent, which is obviously yeah. something that, you know, we hope we're getting beyond, but clearly these numbers still point to that. And in 2019, I believe it's 41.8% of this is all collegiate head coach coaching mm -hmm. positions are filled mm -hmm. by women. So yes. less than 50% of women's sports are coached by women, which again, may be shocking to some people who think we're in a more woke era. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. More woke era. Exactly. And again, I, I, it's, it's a delicate conversation. Um, you know, I really respect coach Muffet McGraw and her stance that she's taken. And, and she's flat out said that, um, you know, she's not coaching anymore, but she wasn't going to hire any more male coaches. I, I totally respect that. And because I know where it's coming from, she wants to give women those opportunities. It's not that, you know, she hates men <laughs> just because it's, it's because there are limited opportunities when you have this crowd and, and of, of people. Um, and it's just not the same balance yet on the men's side. You know, my thing is like, if we had as many women in the, in the pool to, to uh, buy for men's jobs, then, Hey, it's all, you know, we all going for all of them, uh, but it's just not the case. So um, I do think there's a, as a place for men. And I, I played for a lot of great men, male coaches, but um, I really, really value the female coaches that I've had, how they've led and developed me in a lot of ways that weren't just necessarily basketball, but also basketball. You know, I've played for some really smart female coaches, really good ones. Um, and so that's where we just need that opportunity because again, it is so important. There's so many factors that benefit that female coaching female relationship. Yeah. I don't think anyone would perceive this as anti-male. It's, it's, it's all about increasing the talent pool available to make the right choice for an employer basically. And right now there aren't enough of, or it's not the depth of talent in terms of the women coaching women, because there just aren't as many women coaching, which surprised me. Cause again, I thought those were, you know, numbers were, would be higher. I knew yeah. they probably wouldn't be equal, but I knew they'd be higher. So what are some strategies to keep women in coaching? You already talked about obviously the forced situation, which is I'm only going to hire women, which is cool, but what are some ways to be able to increase the talent pool? Yeah, I think it is a, a conscious decision on the part of people like me who have gotten to a place uh, where I have input on who we hire as assistants or who we bring in as graduate assistants. And not only just giving those people opportunities, but investing in them um, and being willing to you know, understand that we, this is, this is a responsibility, um, you know, and even male coaches that are, that are head coaches really giving those opportunities to people that are underrepresented, whether it be female or whether it be minorities of African-Americans, things like that, that just haven't been invested in. And it, and it is, it's, it's what's important long-term or what's going to maybe help me right now in a situation, just band-aiding a situation or, or helping me right now. And if you're really invested <laughs> in what we're trying to do, which is we're doing, we're in women's basketball. We'll just talk about that. Developing young women and not just as basketball players, but developing them to be successful on the court and off. That's what we're doing in college. It's not just, we're not just athletes. We're student athletes and all of the things that go into that. Um, then we need to be invested in the people that are investing in them, the staff, um, graduate assistants. So that's one thing just on our level. And again, really, I, you know, just, just speaking up too, when it comes to, when you have a voice on a campus, uh, with an administration, helping them to understand what's important that, you know, putting our resources and, and looking for places that do, um, promote those kinds of things, hiring practices and, and professional development. Um, those are the types of things on our level that we can do. I would love to get a point to a point with moms and coaching that we're finding ways to make really big change, you know, like advocating at the NCAA level for things like this or, or the national level. I mean, that, that is the ultimate dream of getting 
laws changed or policies changed across the board. Well, and it's it's of note that the WB, uh, WBCA is a very strong mentorship program, has a very strong mentorship program where they try and develop coaches. Uh, and uh, that's always been something that I've admired, uh, which ties in with what you're talking about. The, 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 I guess the other thing is I don't understand from a logical standpoint, whether it's a male team or a female team, having your former players go into coaching, one is a huge compliment, isn't it? And then yeah. secondly, it's logical to want to hire them because they already know the program and the values and the systems, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that has to be a part of it, right? Where you want to develop your players to be future coaches. Absolutely. That's, that's something we value so much here. It's how I got my opportunity here at Florida State to start out with Coach Sue. Um, and we have another assistant on our staff now, Morgan Tolls, who played for us. She was a graduate assistant for us, went off to coach four years at a mid-major and is now back. And again, she has flourished here because she's, re- first of all, she's really, really good and, and passionate and hardworking, but also because she knows our culture. She knows what's important to us. Um, and we knew her, we knew what she would bring. And it, it is, it is literally the most enriching experience for me as someone that's coached her in the past. And that was working alongside of her. It's amazing for our players because they can look at her, they can look at me and say, okay, you not only play college basketball, but you've done it right here. You've done it for coach Sue. Like it, it strengthens that, that trust um, and that buy-in. And then we have a graduate assistant, Ivy Slaughter, who played for us, went and played overseas. And now she's back and we're trying to train her up. I mean, that is the easiest way to continue to invest in women is to do it with the people that you did coach. And again, to show them that um, this is a really rewarding profession. As we know, coaching is, is the basketball piece, the X's and O's, figuring all that out, so fun. It's all the rest of it that's the most rewarding at the end of the day. So I'm imagining what is unique is that there aren't as many females wanting to coach basketball who didn't play collegiate basketball. And yes. like I, I, we have a, uh, um, a woman who helps us with basketball immersion, Debbie Peterson. She didn't play high-level college basketball, but she would love to be a high-level coach. And I just noticed through the process how that is an extra challenge for her to get into coaching because it's another barrier. Oh, you didn't play. Yes. Whereas in the men's game, that seems a little more except, oh, you studied the game tremendously because <laughs> you didn't play. Right. And it's like this yeah. kind of catch 22 that exists. It's that is such a good point and something that's very rarely talked about. Um, and again, I think as more and more women uh, that didn't play get involved at, or feel comfortable getting involved, maybe at the grassroots level. And, and this is another point that, that Muffet McGraw makes a lot is that when you see community sports, um, you know, grassroots level stuff, you, you see men, uh, coaching. And so that is another way that they're getting that experience that, right. They're not sliding in right at the college level. Um, but they're getting that experience that then could build something bigger. Um, and so, yeah, we just need a bigger pool of women that are like the, well, I'm sorry, what's her name? Debbie. Debbie. Yeah. Debbie. Yeah. That, that Somebody hire her. Coach. She's tremendous. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Well, and we have, we have a manager right now who, um, didn't play. She's a, she's a manager for us. Her dream is to be a head coach and she's doing so many great things to first immerse herself into what we do here, but also, um, she's in very active in rising coaches. Like she's gotten herself involved and connected around, um, and I believe we'll be a coach someday, um, uh, because she's connected herself, but the pool is small, as you say, and, uh, something that I hope we can see change, uh, very soon. Yeah, it, it's great. And I know within our members, uh, basketball immersion, uh, we, we have a very healthy female population, uh, great. trying to learn the game to the level of what we share. And then I know rising coach is another great organization and any females listening that aren't a part of rising coaches and have aspirations in coaching tremendous organization. And then obviously we'll talk about this many times, but contact Brooke and let's get you involved in moms and coaching. Cause as you said, like, it's like, you don't want to wait till your mother, right? You want to start right. to learn it before. And that's like any good coach is going to prepare in advance rather than, Oh, I, now I got to learn this. Absolutely. And that's honestly why one of the reasons that I started moms and coaching, because I didn't think about it. I mean, you, you get into this, this 
job and it just takes you. I mean, the, the, the time just goes before you know it, you know, you've been doing it. I've been doing it for 10 years now and I'm going, wait, what? That, how, where did the time go? So when you're wrapped up in that and haven't stopped and thought, okay, you know, what would this potentially look like for me? How would I handle it? It's very overwhelming, more overwhelming, um, than, than anything. So that was something for me that I had gotten so much support, thankfully, just because I happened to be out on the road in July and noticeably pregnant people came to me. If that hadn't been the case, you know, I wouldn't have really known what to do because I hadn't thought it through. So we do, we encourage, um, women that are thinking about it to come to our meetings, but also we want to get that word out about just, Hey, there's a lot of us out here doing this guys ladies, uh, you know, let's start to think about it and understand that it can be done and yeah, start to, to really like embrace the fact that this is something that's really, really cool. And, and if you want to do that, you should feel great about it. I don't want to portray this as only an American problem, certainly a problem everywhere, but a lot of other countries and a lot of other cultures honor women and motherhood much more than America. So this is a significant barrier for those that are listening. And I'm leading to this question, which is for those cynics, why does it matter to have women sport coaches? It matters because we all know that women and men are different (laughs) in a good way in terms of how we relate to each other, how we see the world, are the experiences that we have. And when we have both male and female coaches investing in our younger players um, and bringing that experience, bringing that insight, bringing those different abilities to relate about different things. It makes our world a better place. When we are just confined to the same thing, the same outlook, the same, you know, and not that you can't get that with an all female staff or an all male staff. um, It's limiting. And I just, just think that the way and the the co- the programs that have females male programs that have females whether as a coach in their organization somehow always talk about how it brings that added perspective it brings something different that is needed by humans <laughs> you know whether you're male or female it enhances the experience the growth of the people that we're investing in that's tremendous. It speaks to the diversity piece in general, right? That, that, that perspective and that being around unique people and different people helps us become better humans. And uh, it's just tremendous stuff. And, I'm, I'm, and with your permission, I'll share some of these um, things from uh, the Tucker Center that point out yes. to some of these things as well. And uh, then speaking to someone who wants to get involved in mums and coaching, what, what are some of the steps that you recommend to them in preparing them to be a mother and a coach? Well, I think it's really paying attention to who you're working for. And again, it doesn't mean that if the person you're working for right now is, is you know, not accepting families in the workplace, that that's a bad thing. It's understanding that that's got to be something that you're looking for in your next position, or you're just observing how it's being handled in your current spot and knowing going in, um, if that's something you want and you're going into your next job to understand how to ask those questions. We talk about that a lot with moms and coaching. We had a zoom last month where we had two administrators on the call and you're asking them like, what kinds of questions are, are acceptable to ask in an interview? what are men with families asking in interviews? We don't know that. It was very, Mm -hmm. (laughs) very enlightening to hear what men actually ask. And they ask for stuff for their families. As women, we don't necessarily feel like we can ask for things. So educating Mm -hmm. ourselves on that, on who am I working for? How is a culture Uh, how is the culture, um, family culture where I go, what questions can I ask at my next stop in the interview process all will lead to just feeling more confident about actually having a family. You brought this up twice. So I want to emphasize it to people because sometimes people don't realize that at interviews, they consider you're the one that's only answering questions, but it's almost more important at interviews, the questions you ask. So can you give us some of those possible questions that I should be asking as a male or a female coach when I'm asking about my family at an interview? 
Yeah. I think it, a very just acceptable general one is that what are the expectations when it comes to the, you know, family life? Like our kid, it, like you said, like our kids going to be allowed to be around if they are, what are the limits and expectations? If they're not, there you go. <laughs> they're not around. Um, as head coaches, uh, when head coaches are interviewing with administrations, a lot of it comes into, you know, w- with travel, what am I going to be allowed to do with family on or travel? What accommodations can I get in my contract for if my family is avail- allowed to travel? You know, and we, we found out last uh, on the Zoom call last month that there's male coaches that ask for um, not only their family to travel, but for separate hotel rooms, mm-hmm. um, you know, for their wives so they can focus on the game. You know, things like this are being asked for meals for their family. Um, you know, things like all of those things that as females were looking like, really, they asked for that stuff? That's, you're allowed to ask for that? Um, those are the types of things and for head coaches and assistants, it's a little bit different. Um, but definitely just what are the expectations when it comes to family in the yeah, world? The separate warm room one is a great one. That's definitely something you should ask for. And, and as we know, with these, these questions, like the greatest, the greatest answers are yes and no, the, the not getting any answer is the problem. So, Absolutely. you know, just your organization, you sharing these things that they should be asking is so important. Yes, absolutely. Knowledge is power in, in anything and, and just understanding going into a situation. Um, again, you could, they could pay you a great salary. It could be a really successful program. We've had women talk about this all the time, like a really lucrative, high level job wasn't the right job, you know, and for them, it wasn't worth taking that job because they knew what it would entail in terms of their family life. And so they are much better off going somewhere else um, and have a quality of life that's much better. So we are also in arguably one period of significant growth for women's sports. We saw that in the ESPN ratings for all their collegiate women's sports, where I think basically every sport saw a bump, right? Including the WNBA, if we throw that in there too. And that's wonderful. I mean, we love sports. So we want all sports to do well and we want to support all sports. But uh, talk to me a little bit about this period where we see women's sport, uh, certainly the numbers grow across ratings. Yeah, it's been a really exciting time. And again, I I believe it's one of the silver linings of COVID and everybody (laughs) being shut in and and a lot of sports being canceled and and we didn't have the same exposure to sports and and our opportunities and so the sports that were on everyone was clamoring to and had time to watch not everyone but a lot more people i feel like were just wanting to watch something and gave women's sports a chance and along with the growth of social media and just a platform where um, we don't have to rely on a network to put us on TV or rely on certain companies to, to, you know, endorse certain players to get the word out about female sports or female athletes. You have social media where these athletes can be out there themselves and, and making a name for themselves, which I do think helps. Um, but again, I always say it, I've said it from so long ago that, uh, you know, so many it's about men that I've, that I've come across that are involved in women's basketball. Like you ask them, you know, what got you involved in, in women's basketball? It was just like, they had a daughter or a niece or a friend, uh, a daughter or a friend. They gave it a chance, had no, you know, just, they gave it a chance because it was someone they knew. They just went to watch they fell in love with it. And that's all it takes is just giving it a chance, watching, sitting down and going, Oh, wow. This is, you know, like, this is entertaining. This is good. Um, I think when we have men's and women's basketball, sometimes that, that direct comparison, when people sit down to watch women's basketball, expecting men's basketball that, that, um, inhibits maybe their, you know, buy-in, but when they can watch it as, uh, for what it is and really see it then becomes, they become big time fans. I'm so glad you said that. Cause sometimes I think I think we're afraid to say that, that again, comparison generally doesn't help when we talk about these two things and they are different. And if you look at them as the same, then they're different and that's cool. And that's why we should appreciate them both in their own unique ways. But you're absolutely right. I think like a lot of men sit down and watch and go, Oh, well, it's not the men's game. Well, it's not, 
it's, it's absolutely not. not the men's game. That's exactly the point. And yeah. but but the, what what I think people don't connect is that if you watch the NBA or you watch international professional basketball or you watch Olympic basketball, whether it's men's or women's, those are all different too. It's exactly. not the same game. Exactly. Um, my husband is actually, he's European, he's Spanish. And he says, you know, I don't like watching the NBA as much as I like watching European basketball. They're two different games, you know? So it's, it's, and again, he does like watching the NBA. We watch it all the time, but it, when you understand that they're two separate things, um, just like with women's basketball and men's basketball, women's soccer, men's soccer, um, softball, baseball, you know, then you can really start to appreciate it. John Wooden famously said that he is a huge fan. He prefers the women's game because it's played more, more often than not below the rim, more fundamental, uh, not as physical. You can't rely on those physical abilities just to, to get things done. You have to know the game. So uh, I, hopefully this comes across correct. I'm going to try this. So <laughs> one of the arguments on behalf of the women's game was always, they're so fundamental. And, and I get that, but I also said that was one of the problems with the women's game that I believe has changed so much over the last few years is that now players have a lot more creativity of freedom where you're seeing players express themselves and play more free on the floor. I mean, we can always think about a Diana Taurasi is just this incredible, unique talent, but I believe that that part of the women's game that I think attracted men to coaching them is that they could control them. Yeah. And that that has changed a lot yeah. and that we're giving players the same freedom that we're seeing, say a Trey young play with. And now we're seeing this incredible skill and this incredible talent shine. So I'm kind of anti saying it's because it's fundamental. I'm saying it's because mm -hmm. it's skillful in a different way, right? It's a, as you said, below the rim. So I don't know if I'm on Absolutely. the right track there, but please shoot me down if I'm no. wrong. You're absolutely right. No. And it's not, it, again, yeah. Fundamental, not like it's just dry, like, Oh, we pass, we cut, we're robots out there. That's, <laughs> that's what that's I mean. Not it's not I mean. that. Right. Yeah. No, it's what you're saying. It's, it's, it's skillful it, you, as women. We don't have the physical, again, like a lot of times more physical players that can do things, run faster, jump higher or stronger can get more things done out on the court. Sometimes, you know, as women, um, we, we're not that as the same as men, we can't compare. I mean, it's just biologically a fact overall in general. Um, so we have to be able to be a, skilled in different ways, figure out different ways to, um, you know, score, defend all those things, but it doesn't mean it's not creative. You know, there's still tons of room for creativity. There's still a high six, you know, just people making shots, people playing great defense, blocking, um, blocking shots, dunking now, you know, but again, it happens in a different way, a skilled way, um, just not the brute strength and speed that you see on an NBA floor or college, you know, college floor with men's basketball. Totally, totally. And, and that's really <laughs> what I mean is that we're seeing this, yeah. this movement away from like control and structure to more freedom of play. And uh, it's just been tremendous to watch and enjoyable at all levels. And uh, yeah. you know, selfishly, I have two daughters. So I, I, I want to see them grow up in that environment as well, where, you know, a coach is okay that they throw behind the back pass, because that's the most effective decision, not because yeah. it's flashy, it's just the best decision. Absolutely. There's room for all of that in the women's game. And uh, I, I do think, I, you know, I, I want our players when we're coaching them to do things because it's going to be successful. So if you can throw behind the back pass, like Trey Young did uh, last night, went out of a trap. <laughs> <laughs> it's like good decision. you can zip that thing into your shooter right in his hands or he can, by all means do it um you know but we don't want to just be doing things same thing in the men's game just to do it because it either looks cool or i have a hope that it'll work um you know i i want to be able to do it and if you're capable by all means do it <laughs> so what is the what are some of the high ranking reasons why women are not retained in coaching? Is it, is, is it come down to their personal choice or job or what are some of these factors? Yeah, um, there's a lot of them and, and it, it, some of it is personal choice. Um, but again, I think a lot of it comes, it, you know, stems from uh, societal things of, you know, just like they're not given the same opportunities um, and they are, 
looked at in a different way, maybe in the interview process of, oh no, she's got two young kids and oh, she might get pregnant again. No one's going to say that necessarily out loud right now, but that I think is still in the minds of, of some administrators at times. Um, but again, I think there, there's even a, a, a very like widely said, you know, that women just don't take jobs, even if they're offered, they don't take mm. them at the higher rate. Um, and I think, is, is that of, true or is that um, a myth? I think it's a myth. I think, but I, I think it's also a good question to ask, like why they don't take it. Um, you know, a lot of times the, in, in a family, in a traditional family, uh, the woman is the primary child taker, even if she is working. Um, and she, usually her husband's probably working a job as well. A lot of times I think when, especially with the high level salaries that men make, um, they might have a wife that's not, you know, working outside of the home or a wife that's maybe partner that's able to travel a little bit more and, and kind of follow their career. Um, it varies, uh, you know, but those are some of the things that again, what is the, the philosophy? What is that woman going to be able to do family-wise at that institution? It's very easy to look at the surface level and say, wow, that's a great job. Why wouldn't she take it? She's probably done the research and heard um, and, and decided it doesn't quite fit for her maybe. And that's the thing just to, if we got more um, just on a wider scale of accommodations, support for families, not just mothers, but families, you'd see a lot more women, I think, being willing to, to take some jobs. I even faced this from athletic director administrator, not understanding the non-traditional work hours that coaches mm -hmm. have. And that's gotta be another barrier that unfortunately is there, as you said, when you're trying to balance both, both partners working, it, it creates an extra challenge when a administrator is expecting a coach to be there from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night, or you're not working hard. And hopefully yes. the pandemic has changed that for everybody in every level of work that yes. you can do it in a lot of non-traditional ways. But I'm imagining that's got to be a big piece in this whole thing too. Absolutely. I think, and the pandemic was great for that, that we've seen that we can still be productive with a different type of uh, workplace feel like we don't have to be sitting in our office or in the facility all the time, all day long to get stuff done. Some people need that and just readily say, I, I don't work well at home or, but uh, I think many others have found ways to be able to um, be with their families when they need to be, and then also get work done remotely or different times of the day in the office. Um, and so that's been, that was another silver lining. I think of the pandemic as tough as it was or is, it's still going on. Um, um, that we've seen different ways to be productive. Okay, Brooke, uh, this has been awesome and fascinating, and uh, I hope it's helped coaches at all levels understand uh, mums in coaching and uh, you know females in general trying to retain them in coaching, which is such an important part for the game, all sports, not just our basketball game. Where can they find more information about mums in coaching and about the work that you're doing? The easiest place uh, to find it is at Moms and Coaching, either on Twitter or Instagram. Um, and we have we post events going on and and things that we're having, such as Zoom talks or Final Four meetings. Um, so at Moms and Coaching on Instagram or Twitter, uh, we'd love to have you come there and follow us. And Chris, thank you so much for this opportunity. This was an amazing conversation and appreciate all your insight as well on the, on these, on these issues and for having me on. Well, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the conversation because uh, anything that we can ad ad do to advance sport, which is my chosen career and my chosen passion, <laughs> then uh, absolutely. This is a wonderful conversation. Brooke, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris.